and welcome to Games is Lit 101. When we play a video game, we're stepping into a role. While interacting with a story, we become a soldier, a space explorer, a lawyer, or all sorts of other things. The way we identify with the characters we play is central to the medium's narrative strength. So, this week and the next, we're going to be talking about two broad types of approaches to this concept that video games tend to take. If you've played a decent amount of video games, you may have noticed that there are two major approaches to developing main characters in this medium. Some games will develop a character like most stories do, really. They'll give you a character with their own personality and goals and flaws and all that good stuff. Other games, though, will instead put you in the role of a character with as little character definition and development as possible, or even allow you to just make your own character entirely from scratch, basically allowing you to just project yourself directly into the game world. So let's say the one where you project yourself onto the character is the projection protagonist, and we'll call the other one, where the game defines what the protagonist is like for you, the independent protagonist. Both of these deserve a bit of time to talk about, so we're going to take care of the projection protagonist today and talk about the independent protagonist more next week. The projection protagonist is essentially a protagonist with little to no set character. Traditional concepts of character development don't really apply here because this person is given as little character from the story as possible. Rather, it allows you to define who this character is and how they will act, to varying extents. The most common form of this protagonist, especially for earlier games, is the silent protagonist. This is a main character that doesn't actually say a word for the entire game. It was especially common in early games, which featured very light narrative elements and didn't really have the resources to commit to the protagonist's feelings. I mean, when it comes down to it, we don't need to hear Mario pontificate on the honor of rescuing his princess for Super Mario Bros. to make sense. Since then, the concept of a silent player character has stuck around, but it's adapted to serve a more sophisticated purpose in modern video games. Early in the medium, this mostly took the form of characters who didn't speak because, uh, quite frankly, very few games focused on storytelling very much. But since then, the concept of the silent protagonist has become less a way to minimize storytelling and more a way to let the player easily put themselves into the role of the main character. In Chrono Trigger, for example, Chrono never says a word. But there's so much other story, and so much other dialogue, that this clearly wasn't a lazy choice for the sake of minimizing narrative effort. Rather, Chrono is a vessel for the player. His basic motivations are in place, and his actions imply a few basic things about the character, like his bravery and loyalty, but since he doesn't express himself through words, a good chunk of his character is something you, the player, can define in your own head. This lowers the barrier between Chrono and yourself, allowing you to easily step into his shoes. Of course, the technique was developed a good deal from there. Much later came one of the most famous and beloved of games to use the silent protagonist, Half-Life, which features Gordon Freeman, a scientist at a lab where something goes horribly wrong. This game establishes a lot of the modern techniques surrounding the silent protagonist by keeping the player in the first-person perspective the entire time, never pulling out for cutscenes or anything. It even featured many slow sequences where the player would listen to people talk or wait on a commuter's train or something, even while never breaking the player out of that perspective and control. They could even move around while important story events were happening. In any case, the idea of the silent protagonist is that, aside from some basic actions they take in the story, they never really express themselves in any major ways. This means that while their actions will provide some sort of context for their personality, there's a lot of leeway for interpretation when it comes to their motivations and their feelings. For all intents and purposes, you're thinking and feeling for them. But there is a reason I'm not just making this episode about the silent protagonist. More recently, as technology has developed and we can put more content into our games, the idea of a character that you can project yourself onto has developed far beyond the simple concept of a character who just never speaks. Mass Effect is one of the most well-known examples of a recent game with a projection protagonist, but not a silent one. Shepard speaks, a lot actually, but he never says anything you don't tell him to. Again, the overarching narrative pushes him to broad strokes of action, which is necessary for the sake of following the basic story, but how he does it, what he believes, how he acts, how he treats the people around him, is entirely up to the player to decide. So Shepard is not silent, technically, but he does exist entirely as a vessel for the player. As with most projection protagonists, he does not have a story arc of his own, but instead the story's interpersonal conflict focuses on how he affects the other characters. 
The same tends to be true for other games with these kinds of protagonists. Even games that don't feature voice acting for the protagonist, like Dragon Age Origins and Fallout 3, still use this same concept as the impetus for their main character. A particularly interesting use of this character type comes in the often underappreciated and probably even more often misunderstood genre of visual novels. Games like Clanad and Katawa Shoujo develop their protagonists with a particular character trait at the beginning, but then the player's choices decide how they will develop after that. So in Clanad, for example, Okazaki starts off with a single defining characteristic, apathy brought on by a rough, disillusioned family life then develops in different ways depending on which of the supporting cast he grows close to based on the player's decisions throughout the game. There are a lot of different ways for games to implement this kind of protagonist, but the point is that they exist as a vessel for the player, a way for them to insert themselves into the story and the world seamlessly. It's actually fairly similar to what we talked about a while ago regarding fulfilling player fantasies. It's design centered around the idea of allowing the player to be a part of what's going on. Though in this case it's more designed towards narrative and for narrative purposes than for fulfilling the player's fantasies. We'll go far deeper into this one a couple weeks from now when we give Portal the literary analysis treatment. So this is the basic concept for that. Next week, of course, we'll be continuing our study of protagonist types in video games by talking about the independent protagonist, which puts the player in the role of a character who has their own feelings and motivations and personality and makes their own decisions instead of allowing the player to decide all of those things. So, until then, class dismissed.